your seats. My name is Nina Kivinen and I'm also part of the organizing committee and it is my very great privilege to present to you Raimo Saarinen, this is Sculpture, uh, who's going to tell us about his work and how he works with soil in his work. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you, really nice to be here. And I'm going to talk about soil as a material for artistic purposes and as a content or inspiration for art. And this installation here is my latest. It's called Eyes Open in the Dark. I made it for the Turku Art Museum exhibition that I had this spring. And the idea was to build a cross-section image of a landscape, a valley between two hill, small hills. And I will come back to this work more details a bit later. But first I wanna talk about art making processes and what does it mean for me. Uh, so for me, art is a tool and language to study, investigate, learn and understand the world around me. I often do art because I have to do it. It's a way to process complex ideas that are usually more physical and emotional feelings than a clear ideas. So the initiating force to artwork is often a feeling and visual image of a ready piece, which I then try to realize in the three-dimensional three form. And while building this form or work, it's at the same time phys physical labor and a thinking pro process. And there's so many different practices of doing art and those can vary quite a lot from each other. As a sculptor, I'm interested of the three-dimensional objects and what kind of emotional and bodily experiences these objects and their materiality evokes. In art pieces, I find interesting that the observer reflecting her or his ideas and view viewpoints of the world from the object. So the interpretation depends about the observer. Language of the art is sometimes difficult to understand because it's often reinvented language. And the interesting thing in modern Western art is that it's reshaping the idea of art and trying to re redefine itself at quite rapid pace. In that sense, it's impossible to draw a clear outline of what it is and to make rules as a language that everyone could understand it in the same way. And at the same time, it should be evaluated and feel inside, at least from my point of view. What can be difficult when we haven't got educated to do so? This is some aspect that I have been struggling as a viewer and as a maker of art, like how to communicate through art. And cross-sections and inspiration. The picture on the left is a cross-section image of Katal Höyük a uh, Neolithic village from nowadays Turkey area. And I got a birthday present a history book when I was around 10 years old. And this picture is from that book. And I still sometimes go back to that picture because it has been somehow quite important in my working. Uh, in this picture, I have been fascinated what it shows, that it shows inside and outside at the same time, but also the construction of the building and the materials used. I was fascinated by how much information the image carried and revealed, sometimes that's normally hidden by the outer surface. 
It was informative, organized, beautiful, and surprising, something that I'm still very interested and in trying to achieve in my artworks. Later on, I was in love with cross-checks and imagery in geographic school books of land formation, layers of soil, material, tectonic plates, and layers of the planet and formation of different rocks. Cross-checks and images fascinate because these can show something impossible or almost impossible to see normally. And the works that I'm showing are most, most of the works are from three last years, a bit older. And I have chosen the works that, where I have been using the soil or are connected to the land or soil somehow. And this work is, the height is about this size. The name is Still Life. One of the first sculptures I did by using soil as the main material of the sculpture. The idea for this one came in a forest which was full of trash. First, it was offensive and shocking but sometime, something made me stare and spend some time with that view. Some point, I started to look at the literate landscape on the way that I imagine the dress as part of the forest, like that would be a natural part of the view. I was trying to look the dress without the repulsive and disgusting layer on, just as objects and artifacts in the forest. That was the starting point, and then, and from there, I started to plan how to wrap these ideas into the sculpture in the gallery space. And this is titled 10 times 10 or measuring nature. The idea to this work came from the thought of how is nature understood and what kind of measures do we use to measure the different ecosystems by counting the species of plants and other life forms, what kind of information it gives and what is taken out of consideration by doing this. I was thinking a lot of individual species and the complex symbiotic relationship between species So these are kind of looking taken from straight from the ground dict, but there's, they are all sculpted on the way that the materials are combined in my studio. And and the size is 10 times 10. The one uh, event which gave the idea for this was when I was picking blueberries and I took a little rest on the forest and went laying on the ground and I was watching the landscape from really close and my head on the moss and I was starting to kind of like smelling the different plants and seeing in a bit different way. This is the process picture when I was doing the testing of the works and somehow now I like this even more which was the original idea to cut also the plants to make a really like cube. So maybe continuing this at some point. It was just difficult to make the plants survive a bit longer when it was cut, but I managed to do it with gluing the surfaces. <laughs> and then Neoskaya was quite a uh, long process, or the longest one that far, like two years ago. What I had done, it took maybe 
half a year of planning and executing these works and a series of living sculptures. The first version of this work was part of my thesis in the Academy of Fine Arts and it consists of three hanging glints of soil and plants and a watering system that connecting this with the peas. The watering system gives a fine mist of water spray every 10 minutes. My starting point or first idea was the last of its kind piece of certain kind of forest preserved or kept alive inside, inside environment, a post-apocalyptic view of destroyed landscape like zoo for endangered biotopes. And the size of this is varying, but the soil part was maybe around this size, and then the plants. And I was using Finnish plants from the forest, and also house plants from the stock or plant shops, but trying to create this certain kind of like different kind of uh, biotopes or environments that you could somehow recognize from some part of the world. And here is some process, process pictures. That's the first sketch. And so often my work, I'm trying to create pieces that looks really natural or taken out of the forest or some landscape but they are often really like built in really scratch and used materials that imitates the natural. And then the Western concept of nature, which have been somehow really big team or what I I could say main team in art making. It has got different forms past years, but the main focus and interest have been mostly the same. In the Western concept of nature, I'm the most interested of violent and repressive behavior against nature, or so-called nature. Well, we all know what nature in common language means. When talking about nature, we are usually referring to places which haven't been significantly modified by humans, or the impact isn't so visible, or the modification have happened so long ago that many things the place is in natural state. In the other worlds, looks out of human impact. And the core of the concept is that human is separated by themselves from nature, and most importantly, place it themselves on top of everything. Also, whatever human touch or modify or build becomes separated from nature. Example, if one could cut a tree and chop it to the logs, it would stop being part of nature and become a pile of resource to make a fire or warm a sauna. The idea of nature is very toxic and harmful to other life forms, also for us. Its roots are as old as the Western culture and developed through our, throughout philosophers, religion, science, and our very core of Western culture, mainly because it's so tied up with our modern ways of living. But as any human created concept, the modern Western concept of nature is just an idea and there are many other ideas of nature. When ta talking about nature, I think it's important to speak out about this problem that 
when we do make the separation between nature and humans, we are also making this separation stronger and we keep it alive. So maybe that's also a bit of my question, like how to, how to talk about nature in other ways or like make this clear, the separation. So if you have later on some <laughs> ideas of this, I would be interested. Uh, these are scenarios, uh, close biotopes. The first ones I sealed uh, three years ago. So they are glass cylinders, sealed with silicon and copper. And so the air doesn't change in this. So light and temperature is there. Things can that effect to this in the environment they are. Um, idea was to create different kind of small testes of I put different kind of ingredients or like materials inside like sand and soil, clay, plastics, and different amount of water and seal those and have been watching what is happening and how this different like I have made few really similar with similar plants only different have been the different amount of water which have make a significant difference. Some have collapsed the ecosystems and new kind of life have appeared like mold and mushrooms, fungi. So they look quite dystopian but are still very much alive. This was sealed in three years ago and this is the picture for the time it was sealed and this is now how it looks after three years. So it had been growing, some are still, plants are alive and growing. So this is the more like maybe dystopian image of what's happening inside. And then something with different materials that I have been using that, but I relate them really closely to earth. This is called Crystal Lake. It was work I was already interested in the soil and how complex and full of life the living soil is. I got interested in the commercial fertilizer throughout the ability to form a big and nice looking crystals. That was the starting point. And then I, so these are made with fertilizers uh, on a class. I was fascinated by the visual aspect of this material and also what connection you make through the materials when it's kind of out of it content contest. And I wanted to use glass as a surface to kind of make and the glass plates which are hanged a bit maybe dangerously or a bit hazard that you could get maybe a little bit of feeling of danger or that there's something, something could just fall down from the wall. And also the fragility of the materiality or the class.
and then stones and boulders. I wanted to create a sculpture for the stones, respect for the stones by making a sculpture, like a statue of an important person. And usually, you don't, of course, use the material of the subject, but some other fine material. I made this work from paper pulp or paper mache, and I like it the contrast of using relatively fragile and lightweight material, which also allowed me to play with the gravity. So I made a bit different sizes of these stones. And it was hung quite different ways and I wanted to again emphasize this like feeling of danger or like in here you have to go through the doorway and the size of this is a bit more than two meters by the length. And how I see my role as an artist is to make people see other options, to see instead of watching. That's my goal. I'm trying to do this by showing something unexpected, familiar things in a new light or surprising weird combinations. So this is the eyes open in the dark, the latest installation, and the name is referring to the place where you are not able to see, and also a situation where you are refusing to see, or are not willing to see. The work is about soil layers and the world underneath us. What is underneath us? It's something that most of the people don't think about much. And it's something difficult to think or vis visualize. This world that we don't have visual access. We can take some drilling samples or sometimes see a glimpse in land landslides or beach bluff. It's kind of a cross-section landscape where you can go in or between. And it was 30 of the columns or pillars. And I did use the sand and soil and clay from hardware stores. I had to, I was doing this in the winter and that was uh, only way to get because there was so much snow. And I kind of also liked the idea of going from this commercial products backward to its more natural state of mixing different kind of grain sizes to create this uh, sand. And then maybe I will also show the ongoing project that I'm working at the moment and it's in really beginning and still in sketching place. So I'm building a floating island and that I'm doing collaboration with Lundström Art Museum in Rauma and it will be ready at 21. So I have still <laughs> like one and a half years time to execute this. And it will be around 30 square meters, the land area of this island. And there will be trees and vegetation. And there's the, yeah, maybe the cross-section image is 
giving most of the information. So the water level would be here. So there's a beton pontoon that is keeping it on the water surface floating. And yeah, if you have any comments or ideas, it would be really nice to hear about. Thank you. Thank you so much for the absolutely beautiful work that you're doing. I'm quite sure there will be lots of questions and comments on your work. Comments, questions? After seeing your nice works, I would say that they are not sculptures but installations. Yeah, that's true. You can see it also that way and often I... I like them. <laughs> Thank you. I don't like installations usually. <laughs> yeah, it's really difficult sometimes to like put yourself some lockers or make the, like how you see your own working, if it's sculpture or if it's installation or what it is. Sometimes I feel the works are more sculptures and in some points they are installations, but yeah, that's true. I think quite many are installations. Thank you. It was very interesting. I liked the one, the picture with the sofa in the arts museum and the earth coming down. It really illustrated what what you are doing. I have a simple, silly, small question connected to this one. That's this huge island that you're building. What is your relationship to bonsai, the Japanese these miniature things? Yeah, it's. It's a good question and interesting, like, I have been thinking bonsais a lot, like, and I have been doing a bit of bonsai style of works where I have been tying up tulips to prevent them to grow naturally. And also the, the idea behind or creating the kind of ideal miniature tree is, is incredible and it's somehow like disturbing also. It's like really the also I think it's so much about how I see Western concept of nature kind of like ruling the, or you can modify the landscape or plants or did that <laughs> answer it anyhow the question. What's your relationship to sorry 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 it's a question behind you. So, sorry, yeah. Yes, I was interesting to interested to know you had the <clears throat> the plant hanging from ceiling a few pictures back in a beautiful house room living room. Can you tell me w which place that is? Is it what I think it is? And then <laughs> uh, is your work like temporarily? It's for three years, five years. This this is very nice. Uh, so, what? How long will it be there? How long was it there? And for instance, the tubes that you had, for yeah. how long will they be sealed and uh, looked upon? Well, this one is in Kirpila Art Museum in Hesperiankatu, Helsinki, and they bought the work, but we have a contract for ten years. So it's going to be there 10 years at least, and then they can throw it away or keep it. <laughs> I don't know, it's 
So it's still like quite new thing to have this living things in sculpture or installations. And it's, yeah, it's quite difficult to uh, buy this kind of works or have it in the collection. But we made this kind of deal that I go a few times in these 10 years to check that everything is okay and do some maintaining if it needs. But at least now it's doing well there. It has been there two years and they are watering it once a month. <laughs> And yeah, some of the works are really for short period of time because of the plants and some are meant to last for, well, 10 years or more. And ha like these ones, my plan have been that they will be as long as the glass tubes and the silicone holes so they might change a lot but it's still for me the same sculpture it's just like I kind of really like also the idea how I do these sculptures in certain point and then I have to leave it and the, it starts growing or keep on changing and it's sometimes really difficult to leave this uh, out of my hand, kind of that I can't control it anymore. But I think it's also a nice idea that I can't control it. No, uh, but no, so, wait. <laughs> Did you want to ask a question in front? Uh, she didn't want to. No, okay, okay. When well, then I have Anna here first. Yeah, thanks. This is, is really, really, really interesting. I think when we, uh, from the um, organizing committee, uh, visited and, and had a, uh, the art museum and, and saw your your um, installation or sculpture, I don't know what you want to call it, but um, it, fantastic. And uh, I'm a marine biologist, and uh, I instantly thought of one thing that you have a lot of plants, and I can see that the plants are the, the main thing that you want to sort of show and so on, but I am presuming there's animals in there as well, right? That can also transform, and have you thought about that somehow? Yeah, there I have been thinking, and it's still... It's, I, I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> still like, I think it's on process of like, but I'm interested in like everything that happens in the soil, like all the microorganisms and fungi and worms. Yeah, still. Also these had some worms I noticed later when I was, had seal it them and <laughs> what about animal bones? Sorry? Animal bones. Yes, and wood or how do you use? They are on the ground. Yeah. Not I haven't put any animal bones there or used those as like specifically like I haven't been so interested of animals, at least not mammals or bigger animals. I have a question over there. Thank you very much. This is a fascinating body of work. And I'm, I was particularly struck by the, the image of the clipped plant at the beginning, the, the, the cube where you cut the leaves. Yeah. Um, it seems that the essential relationship that you have is an absurd one or an ironic one and that 
this irony or absurdity of human distance or an absence of complete integration with nature is uh, a, a core theme. And I'm interested if you could uh, elaborate on what you might do with such a project to explore that idea a little further. Yeah, that's a good question. I, yeah, I think I see it everywhere so often, this kind of like really violent acts like how do we use the surroundings and everything else, like all the soil, rocks, and plants. And I'm not really sure how to <laughs> answer this. I don't know uh, if you would be familiar with Yoko Ono's cut piece. Do you know yeah. that? She, she had visitors come up from the audience and cut her clothing off her body um, as a way of, of celebrating in a dark way the violence or the um, vulnerability of this relationship to environment. And I think I've, I saw the, a, a kind of analog with your, your piece in that sense. Mm. No need to answer, but I just thought I'd yeah. share that. Okay. Yeah, I think also that sometimes I have been kind of like torching that plants with fields, which is really violent. And I guess I'm just like processing this, this, the same things that I'm seeing all the time that's happening and just like bringing them in different light or with different, it suddenly really changes when you bring something into the gallery space and show like flowers or some plants that are taken out from their roots and put in the space. Yeah. I have a question concerning these sealed um, tubes. Um, so as far as I know, plants consume um, carbon dioxide and then they exhaust um, oxygen. And after a while, there must be so much oxygen and so few um, CO2 that, the, that I would have presumed the, the, the plant will die. So do you know how that works or what is the... I think somebody here could answer it better, <laughs> <laughs> maybe some. Uh, but I thought it was the microorganisms or things in the ground that are using the CO2, but I'm not sure. But somehow, some of the plants are still living after three years, so there have to be some kind of balance between the different organisms there. So does anybody know how this kind of... <laughs> Anyone want to explain? <laughs> I think... Uh maybe photosynthesis is with light, it consume oxygen, without light it uh, con consume carbon dioxide. So it's, uh, when it has light, it uh, kind of consume oxygen and uh, without light, it's a reverse pr process mm. yeah. in the darkness. Thank you. Uh, any more questions or comments? Thank you very much. I'm very moved by your work. And 
I have a different um, attitude towards the 10 by 10 um, blocks of earth uh, because it's not only violent, uh, they can be used to build houses. And my father was indeed um, born in a sod hut on the Canadian prairie that had never been cut before. And um, many people had their first habitation in a sod hut. Um, and of course, bricks are made out of sod. And um, so I'm, I'm very uh, positive towards those. I just wanted to present another point of view. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm not distressed by them. And secondly, this is just a comment. We saw those uh, three of those um, cylinders in Fiskars at the Biennale a couple of days ago, last week. Okay. And so they're still there until September 15th. If anyone wants to go and look at them, they're wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? Thank you. Um, I also find these to be very beautiful uh, and moving. Um, I wanted to, we were talking last night about the island and you did tell us a little bit more about it here, but um, in this case, you were saying that the island might be around for 60 or more years. And then the animals definitely come into play in a different way here also. But I wondered if you're thinking about the underneath of the island as a part of the sculpture. And yeah, because the way you have the cut there, it looks like your focus is very much on the soil and what's above. But I think a lot of things are going to happen on those walls underneath too. So what are you thinking about that? Yeah. I have been thinking about it a little bit, but not enough yet. And that's something that I should work on more because of course it's like big thing. What's it's like top of the iceberg, what's on top of the water. And there's maybe some possibilities to make it uh, better for uh, or make it on the way that some kind of like small ecosystem can develop underneath. Uh, on what principle you decide the sizes of your work? Mm, I think it's mostly feeling based. I just like what often it depends. Sometimes if I know already this place where it's coming, I'm taking consideration of the space and the uh, how it fits there and what are the like yeah I'm thinking a lot about the space if I know it and that affects about the size otherwise it's it can it depends about the idea like in the rocks that I have been doing different sizes it's I have been trying out different sizes and how they affect on the, on the space. How do you feel when you are close to different size of the rocks? So it's, I think, it's difficult to answer that, but it depends on the idea. Right, thank you. Do you have another question? Uh, thanks. Um, I'm really amazed about your work and um, a really precise question. I, I found the chains quite provoking on the hanging 
uh, pieces. So are you using the chains like in every case you were hanging them or might, might it change with what you are hanging them? Uh, I wanted to use, they wouldn't need that like strong chains. I wanted to use them to make them look heavier what they are. So that was the reason to why I chose these heavy chains that they could support the weight of the soil and plants if it would be really full block of soil. So it's not actually a full block of, of soil, the, the base, or? No, there's the, here is the, so there's a big net and there's a paper clay. And on top of that, it's just a small layer of soil. So it's empty and then there's the container. Where is the, there's the plastic container where the plants are. So they weight about 100 kilos each. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any final questions? Then I think we want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And now I will hand over to Ruth. I think we can do with this beautiful image here while we end the seminar, don't you think? It's a wonderful, wonderful. Um, visualization of our theme. So, dear everyone, we are approaching the end of this year's Abu Agora. Once more, we've reached the end of, of this seminar. And uh, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, my name is Ruth Ilman, and I'm also part of the organizing committee of this event. As we started on Wednesday here, uh, my colleague Anna Turnroos greeted you by saying, welcome to Earth. And I will not assume that you're leaving Earth now, but I still wish to say a few words of conclusion, just to sum up the three days that we have spent together on Earth here in Sibelius Museum. Uh, in his opening words on Wednesday, our advisory board member, Academy Professor Hannu Salami, noted that Abu Agora really has become a concept of its own. It um, gives and has always given a space for discussions across disciplinary boundaries between the arts, uh, humanities and sciences, also breaking the boundaries of ordinary conference sessions and, and making quite unexpected interventions. Over the nine years we've been organizing this event, um, this has become somewhat of a trademark of Abu Agora, and I'm really proud and content to see that also this year we managed to break some boundaries, and not just some, but I think quite many. Uh, we opened a new book in our history this year, the Book of Five Rings, written by Miyamoto Musashi some 400 years ago. Following his division into elements, we've started out with the first element, Earth. Next year, we will dive into water, followed by wind, fire, and void. In the program booklet, we've written as follows. The Earth, planet Tellus, on which we live, is a fundamental aspect of human life, spanning the past, our present, and our hopes for the future. Our relationship to the element of Earth has renewed its relevance and urgency today, as the traces of past utilitarian and industrial centuries, combined with human greed, indifference and exploitation, have driven Gaia to despair and to the brink of collapse. 
Our aim was to deal with Earth from as many points of view as possible. And indeed, we have heard scholars of history, literature, religion, biology, migration, literature, technology, geology, archaeology, archaeology, economy, as well as musicians, visual, visual artists, poets, performance artists, just to mention some of the aspects of the richness and plurality we have experienced. Uh, we have talked about the relationship between human rights, as in rituals, and animal rights, about Earth, others, and the romantic mind, about the deceiving permanence of Earth and architecture, about gardening and grace and greed, about trees as gateways into the archaic past of humanity, and as a material for artistic work. Earth as a contested political realm and a lost mother, and we've heard plants sing. Earth is soil and dirt. It is a politically contested entity, a mythological paradise, a longed for and lost home, an ecological disaster. What has struck me as I have followed the lectures and workshops over the past days is how interlaced these different dimensions are. Many of our discussions of Earth have started in ecological concerns, climate change and consumption, but we've soon noticed that such is issues cannot be separated from politics, colonialism, dominance and exploitation. Also the historical, cultural and religious dimensions connected to life on Earth arose time and time again. And it seems we cannot deal with each dimension one by one but need to encircle and fathom them all at once. This thought makes me exhausted and humble, feeding the suspicion that I fall short at the challenge of the Earth. But then again, it also makes me responsible. What do historians do with the apocalypse? Sandra Swart asked in her Agora talk on Wednesday and answered her own question by stating, Historians have the duty to haunt and harm, and maybe help. I think this holds true for all of us, who seek new perspectives, new questions, renewed understanding, and hopefully new ways of acting and responding to the despair of Gaia. I was encouraged by Swart's statement that it is events like this that go beyond the conventional academic conference or conventional art event to challenge the borderlands and reboot our brains that carry the promise of changing human hearts and minds. So let's get our hands dirty in anticipation of the water that will cleanse us next year. In a minute, we will end on a musical note with Lux Or, but before that, we have gratitude to express. I would like to thank all my companions in the organizing committee from the University of Turku, Obu Academy University and Turku University of Applied Sciences. It's been once more a great honor to work with you all and to plan this event. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we also want to thank our longtime financers, all the educational institutions that I just mentioned, but also our Obu Academy University Foundation, Konen Satya, and Svenska Kulturfonden. They have made it possible for us to plan years ahead Five years, that's a lot, it's a treat for us. But above all, uh, above all at this point, I want to thank the three super women who have made this year's Abu Agora practically possible. First of all, coordinator, Lisa Lalu, would you please come up here? Lisa here, she has given her heart and soul to this event this year, and without her, this would never have happened. She has organized everything and kept track on all of us, so we are really indebted for her dedication, and we hope she will bear with us many years to come. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks. And we have some.
And this year, we have also been fortunate enough to have two academic trainees with us, to, uh, and whose work has been astonishing, astonishingly professional and very visible to you because they have been planning most of the marketing and the layout of our event this year. So Paula Mackinen and Frida Bachmann, could you please come up here? So these are really the ones who have made it all happen. But I'm sure you have also noticed that we have been aided by student assistants all these days, during these three days, who have been making everything work so nicely for us. So all of you student assistants who are here and all of the personnel from the Sibelius Museum, would you please also just wave at us so we can give you also applause. However, Abuagura would be nothing without our audience. So my last and largest thank you goes to all of you who have been here through these three days. And uh, after we've been listening to the music now with Lux Or, we want to treat you all to a farewell reception at the Donner Institute, which is located two houses away in that direction. So we are now at uh, Biskopsgat and Peace Pankato 17, and we then move to number 13, which is the Renaissance looking. It's not from the Renaissance, but it's sort of copying a Renaissance style villa two houses away. And we hope that you will all join us for a reception there to, to have some nice food and some nice wine and continue the discussions. So please follow us there when we have ended here. We hope that you will really join us there because it's been a fascinating time for us with the earth and we want to continue from here. Now, I'm not going to talk anymore, but now I will give the word to our e-music ensemble, Luxor, to give us a great ending of this Abu Agora. Thank you. Okay, while we set up a little bit, um, mainly taking some stuff away from the stage, I could say a couple of words about uh, what's going to happen now. Um, Imusi Group Luxor as a band has been around since 2008, but um, what's going to happen today is a kind of different kind of collaboration because we have two visiting artists with us. Uh, Lubena and Vesanova, who will provide us with something um, extraordinarily special. And um, we start today with Erde, German word for earth, and our idea, we are, I mean, we don't want to reveal all our secrets. You will hear them and think, give your own, have your own sonical um, interpretation of what we do. But it is an evolutionary cycle, and it's to do with um, the relation between human beings and the nature and the question of evolution question of both earth as soil and, and then involvement with technology and what does that mean. So without further words, um, we will let the music do the talking and then after we have finished, please join us for the reception. Thank you.
Mahdi Anglistik Gedanken, Mahdi Vertraut mit allen Techniken und Kunsten, Mahdi Anglistik Gedanken, Mahdi Vertraut mit allen Techniken und Kunsten, Mahdi Anglistik Gedanken, Mahdi Vertraut mit allen Techniken und Kunsten, Mahdi Anglistik Gedanken. Mache die Welt raut mit allen Techniken und Kunsten. Halte dich nicht mit nützlosen Beschaffungen auf.